Hanno and uh, uh, Jeff, thanks for joining. Uh, obviously, if we look at uh, the two companies that you're both uh, in, right? We're talking about Avid, so got tools that uh, facilitate content creation. And then we look at Microsoft, which obviously is uh, allowing or pr uh, presenting that infrastructure. Uh, I think maybe we should talk about how the cloud is part of the new creative paradigm, but not just the new creative paradigm, because obviously both Avid and Microsoft have been doing this for years. So the first thing I'd like to jump in and talk about is over the past six weeks or so, uh, there have been an immense amount of folks and, and companies who have jumped on to the, I, I don't want to say cloud bandwagon, but have realized that, you know, the, the promise uh, matches, uh, it, it, the promise matches practice. So the years of planning that have gone in with Avid and, and, and Microsoft to, uh, to present this foundation to work on uh, is what we've seen in terms of usage in the past six weeks and how people are using it in line with what was prognosticated by your two companies? Yeah, you want one of us to go first? I guess I'll, I'll jump um, from the tool side and let Hanno talk about uh, the cloud st structure. First of all, Hanno, by the way, uh, congratulations on the appointment to the CTO of Media Entertainment for Azure. That's terrific news. I think that's big news for the industry. I think it's great for Microsoft. What a big, uh, what a big win. So you're going to help them focus on media, which is great. But it, you know, that just speaks to our partnership. I'm glad, glad you're there. So good to see you. I've known Hanno a long time, so it's great to see you at Microsoft. But I think, you know, Michael, a good point is, is um, and thank you for having me on, really appreciate the time and everybody being here. It, you know, it is, you're right, it, it's, un I mean, look, I'm gonna, I hate almost using some of these words because everyone's using them, but you know, there, it is unprecedented what's going on. I think what we saw, and I think what we should first reflect on, we should actually congratulate ourselves as an industry because this industry, you know, and I'm sure we'll talk about it, has really moved to the cloud quite slowly. Maybe the play out centers and kind of that part of the business went, went, but we've been moving quite slow, especially where Avid plays in the content creation side. It's just been, been moving pretty slow. And there was, I think people taking a careful approach to it. I think what this crisis did is show this industry that we can do it. If you look at how hundreds of media companies around the world immediately had to jump onto workflows that were allowing remote production and remote collaboration and people working from home. It's amazing what we accomplished when we had to. I mean, you look at what, American Idol did last Sunday night. I thought that was uh, I thought that was pretty impressive. You know, what they what they dealt with leveraging you know everybody remote. But yeah, I think I think Michael, it's it's um, you know the last six weeks, if anything, have taught us all that we can do this and that these things are possible. And I think a lot of people are learning just how powerful the cloud is and what it can do for people. Not just I know there's always discussion around capex and opex and variableizing your infrastructure and all the things we have a tendency to talk about. But I think what it's empowering. Uh, even before you get into the world of AI and all the powerful things coming, but what's empowering to get people to work, work, you know, when and where they want to have basically distributed content creation. It's pretty powerful. And I think the crisis is teaching us that pretty quickly. I don't know what your thoughts are. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, and thanks for the shout out. So I, I started at Microsoft uh, March 23rd. So that was what, four days after the lockdown uh, was announced, at least here in California. And um, you may <laughs> talk about, you know, jumping in at the deep end there. Uh, and, and so the first, uh, you know, few weeks on the, on the job, I basically witnessed how, uh, you know, we're scrambling with the rest of um, the media industry, especially with our partnership with Avid here, to figure out how do we actually keep, you know, um, the production work, you know, workflows, you know, going as much as we can, uh, keep people gainfully employed and help the industry, you know, keep churning out uh, content that people obviously want to watch, especially uh, in times like, like these. And, um, and I got to say, um, obviously the industry that's worked on this for a very long time. So we've been working with Abbott on this for a while. Um, and there's a lot of structural and, and whatever issues that kind of, you know, slowed that down a little bit. But I think with, with the pandemic hitting, uh, you know, we're, we're really seeing uh, this pivot. We, we, we need to provide, you know, uh, solutions so people can work from home. Uh, people are embracing these solutions now, especially on the, on the editing and the cloud side. I mean, we've seen huge growth there. Uh, we've been able, together with, with uh, our partners like Avid and Terra Dici and so on, been able to very quickly respond. Uh, there's a lot of shows now um, that... Uh, that are able to to have their editors work from home. Uh, they're, they're finishing things. Uh, we're, we're we're putting stuff through the pipeline. I think there will be content produced and published here 
uh, over the next weeks and months, basically do the work that we've been doing. And I think the what the pandemic really did was just take a number of things that were planned and, and things that people worked on uh, and just uh, really accelerated the rollout of this because when it's always the same, when there's a huge demand, a huge need, all of a sudden people pull resources and figure out what to do. Jeff, you brought up something uh, very uh, interesting that I wanted to tip on, and thanks for the, the great segue, is that why has m and &E, uh, as a coworker would say, uh, been led kicking and screaming to the cloud? Uh, is it just the aforementioned OpEx versus CapEx, or is it the fact that um, it's there's no all-you-can-eat methodology, right? When you typically rent gear or buy gear, you can use it as much as you want. You've already paid for it, and the cloud is a little bit different in terms of pricing. What, what's really been the, the stop, uh, not the stop gap, but what's been the limiter, do you think? Yeah, I, I, a couple things. One is I think, you know, there are some real, I mean, things people have to adjust for, right? There is, there's a difference financially and how it works and, 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 and there's a difference technically, obviously for people, but as someone who has, is born and raised in m and &E, you know this about me, Michael, I've been in this business since I started, came out of college, um, is, so I, I guess I get to say this because I am from m and &E. we're a cautious bunch and uh, we have a tendency to go a little slow on things. I mean, there's some great innovation. I don't want to take away from what we're accomplishing as an industry. I mean, it's amazing what the m and &E, what, you know, what we do. But on embracing kind of these technology shifts, we've always been a little bit careful and a little bit slow at, at some of this. And you, you even mentioned in your opening remarks, or, or, or Eric did, sorry, about the you know tsunami in Japan that, that changed the, the face of the tape business and file-based workflows. You know, it was another one of those situations where, you know, it was moving along and we were moving along carefully, but when that tape wasn't available, all of a sudden everybody had to make a quick decision. I think that's kind of what's going on here in the in the space, and I think this just forced people to give it a try. And so I think hopefully it'll get people to move quicker. But I just think, look, I think there's a lot of money on the line. You know, in our business, you know, you're not supposed to have black air. You're not supposed to have things go wrong. People expect to watch what they want to watch, and so we got, we have to be rightly very careful as an industry. And there, again, there's a lot of money on the line in in these streams. But um, I, I think it's just you know it's a little bit the way this industry is, and and uh, it's okay. It's fine. I think this will accelerate, I'm sure. Yeah, and I would just add that, uh, you know, there are, I think there have been hurdles or perceptions actually more more than hurdles uh, that are somewhat related to technology, but they're also very structural. Uh, so for example, on the, on the technology side, people have been work, worried about latency and that sort of thing. And that's obviously something that is there, uh, especially if you run a live broadcast, you know, the operator hits take, I mean, the take has to t come immediately and uh the, you know the image needs to switch to whatever or when you're um an editor uh or a visual effects artist or something like that there can't be a whole lot of a lag between you know your 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 pen movements or your your keystrokes and whatever and what actually happens um, um on, on your ui um but i think what we've seen in terms of latency actually is that um it's actually not that bad uh we're, we're you know overall i think the, the editing crews that we're working with they're they're quite happy with with how well it works um another co um, concern over the years always has been uh security uh and i think people mistake you know the security of something that's just sitting on some public server out there on the internet with uh the security of uh content in, in the cloud environment like ours. Uh, I would actually say that um, because we're applying the same um, security paradigms and uh, rules, uh, permissions, what have you, on everything that's on our cloud, uh, there's actually a lot more consistency across the different types of content and the different types of users uh, against um, the security of that content. If you look at a traditional production, uh, you have the production crew on set, you have uh, the studio, you have, uh, you know, the post-production house, you have uh, visual effects companies and so on, and they're all working on the same project. And they're all in a, in a changing content, but they all have their own approach to cybersecurity. So you actually end up with a very fragmented security picture, which I think that the cloud really resolves uh, very well. And I think people are starting to see that advantage actually. So in, in what used to be perceived as a, as a hurdle actually is turning out to be an advantage. Uh, but the last thing I would say is there's also, uh, you know, uh, structural issues, uh, especially the, the, the movie business has evolved uh, historically 
I mean, we've been doing this for over 100 years now. Um, and even though the, the technology in terms of capture, editing, uh, post-production, visual effects, whatever, has obviously moved in leaps and bounds over the last 100 years, the overall business structure around how a movie is made and also the, the core workflow actually hasn't changed all that much. And that's also, I think that's also been a hurdle uh, towards cloud adoption that everything is so fragmented and everybody kind of does their own thing and it's all based on bilateral relationships. Um, I think that's, that's another one, but I think now people are waking up that we need to change things. And, and, and I think uh, uh, people are willing to listen now and have that discussion. I mean, the other thing also is if you're in operations or if you're just trying to, you know, release one movie after the other, it's really hard to kind of take a step back and say, okay, we're going to actually redo all this uh, to, to make it more efficient. Um, and so, uh, and you see this in all kinds of industries, right? Change is, is, is never embraced by the people that actually need to do the work on a daily basis. Um, and so this pandemic actually is kind of a breaking, um, not a breaking point, more of a, uh, of a pivoting point here in the industry, really providing an opportunity to kind of rethink how we're doing things. And it's I almost like the phrase inflection point. That's, that's what, how I've kind of been identifying this, at least internally. Uh, in the past uh, six weeks, and even before that, is there kind of a, uh, if you had to pick the perfect media use case, right? Is it for smaller groups? Is it for larger groups? And the reason I bring that up is, you know, when, when everything started happening several weeks ago, everyone rushed to the quickest solution they could. Now we're in kind of a more measured approach, right? Because they've got their stopgap for the time being, and now they need to plan for the future. Mm -hmm. And you inevitably get the question of, is the cloud right for me or is the cloud right for us as an organization? So have you come across a good, if this is what your uh, uh, thumbprint is, right? If you're working on something on a monthly basis or something that's working on a weekly basis or what is kind of the, the fingerprint of someone who should really be looking into the cloud more than anything else? Maybe I'll be bold and say, I think everyone should be looking at the cloud. Oh, Jeff, uh, come on. But I think, I think that, <laughs> Cloud's a big word and it's also a small word. I don't, I'll explain what I mean in a moment, but it, it, you know, cloud means a lot of things to a lot of people. I, I think that the, you know, if we're talking about completely moving everything you're doing into the cloud, I don't know, that's a very specific use case of someone that's building out, let's say a complete production chain or a complete uh, media, you know, content supply chain end to end in the, in the cloud. That's bold and I think we'll get there very quickly, but I think that's maybe not, not what we're gonna be doing in the next, next little bit here. But I think Michael that, you know, I, I can almost argue on any case of a small team, a medium-sized team, whether you have a permanent infrastructure or you're a, a partnership for a short period of time, I can probably, and, and probably my team can do a better job than me, but, you know, is, is I can almost make an argument for a, for a use of cloud in some way in almost every workflow we do in media and every type of operation. There are so many benefits to what it can do, whether or not you're looking to actually edit in the cloud and, and, and do collaborative editing in the cloud, whether you're trying to do backup or disaster recovery or business continuity or be able to move people remotely around the world. There's so many things that cloud unlocks from a capability standpoint. I don't think there's one answer. I think it really takes looking at what, you know, the problem and, and the opportunity that someone's trying to pursue and, and how, can, how can new technologies, including cloud, um, help them do that. But there's, there's so many variables in that. I think it, it really depends on it. But I, I would say anybody who says they don't need the cloud is probably kidding themselves. I think the technology is pretty important for almost everything we do. Sorry, Hans. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Absolutely, 100%. I think it, it, it'll, it'll run the gamut of small production companies all the way to the to the studios, obviously, who are kind of driving that change already. And I think there's a short-term uh, aspect of this, which is um, if you're looking at uh, the state of the art, you know, the state of the the state of Hollywood right now, uh, you know, you in, in development. Uh, so the front part of the workflow, obviously, a lot of activity there. Uh, people can write scripts at, at home and and de develop pitches and what have you, and storyboards and all that. And we're helping uh, on the back end to, to enable uh, post-production workflows also in the cloud. Uh, there's this piece in the middle, which is uh, principal photography or you know, physical production, which is on hold right now due to the pandemic. And I think companies are already starting to figure out, okay, how do we actually 
go back to work? How do we actually start shooting stuff again? And I think part of that's going to be how do you, uh, you know, make the, the set a safe environment for the crew and for the cast. And I think part of that is going to be the reduced number of people that have to be there in the first place. And so you, we have to figure out a lot of remote access uh, solutions for that in the short term. And I think um, uh, cloud technology can really help there. Uh, but also a longer term, uh, you know, this is a global business. Um, people are collaborating globally and it doesn't matter if that's, you know, the next Avengers movie um, where literally a global team is working on that. But also even smaller projects like, uh, like music videos, for example, where you need special effects and uh, visual effects and you have maybe uh, a little special effects house in, in, in Eastern Europe or somewhere in Asia because of the cost of labor there. Uh, and you want to work directly with them again you know leveraging cloud technology enable those types of workflows uh, i think uh, makes a lot of sense um, i think the the tools aren't all there today to really uh you know uh, do that today but i, I think that's the, the the type of vision that we're actually working on is that all types of productions all types of uh you know content um, you know get produced in the cloud and distributed from a from a cloud resource uh, you, uh, I love the fact you entered you entered on your point on that because that speaks right to what Jeff was bringing up, which is, uh, you know, there can be an argument for just about uh, just about any position in production or post production that being used in the cloud. But mm -hmm. I think it's very important to kind of level set as to what can be done today. So right, practice versus promise. So you know, we have the emerging standards of HDR. We're doing uh, a Dolby Atmos, right? But when we start looking at those particular types of things, those are still difficult in the cloud. Right, being able to grade in the cloud is very difficult. The cloud could be used as a transport mechanism, but you're not really viewing an HDR image from a machine in the cloud. Uh, we're not using. Uh, I'll drop the Pro Tools name, right? Uh, because that's the the 800 pound gorilla. That's not being done on the cloud. So while there can be an argument, obviously there are certain things that probably are still best suited on premises. And I think that's kind of what I was getting to. Yeah, I think, Michael, what I'd say that is it's true. I mean, there's certain things, I mean, like as an example for, for doing, you know, any elaborate audio mixing, the monitoring as an example is an issue, how to get the monitoring back, you know, because there's no, there's no yet, I mean, there's some things opening up, but there's not like something today that we could deliver a solution today to do that. But I do think though that it, it is this, it's what I mean by the word cloud. Cloud has a small, there's a small word in cloud too is that if you look at as an example and I, you know, it, look at an example of like what was done to, to mix, um, you know, just because I watch American Idol and I don't know how they did it last weekend, but the fact that they had people mixing from home or even I know the Saturday Night Live people, they're doing their show and they're doing the mixing from home. They are using the cloud to work together. They are using a machine in their home to do the mix and they've got their monitoring and their, and their speakers, but they are leveraging the cloud to share files or they're using, we have a tool called Cloud Collaborate where people can share tracks and can move tracks over the, over the use of Azure Cloud. And so I think in that, even in that case, cloud is being used to help people do tracking or, or break up projects and work on projects. But you're right, to be able to, like, you know, I mean, we were talking earlier about editing the cloud. Latency is an issue, but I think it's a lot less of an issue than people realize because uh, you know that too, Michael, from the company you're with now, is you know people are generally pretty surprised just how how good it feels when you're editing um, you know in a in a basically in a browser basically through a through a cloud connection. Um, there's some limitations, obviously, monitoring is one of those also in that case. But I think it does perform right well. But I think it really depends on what you're trying to do. I think obviously I don't know yet if we're going to be fully running Pro Tools in the cloud on a you know, 500 channel mix, but, but it's going to take some time to get there. But I do think cloud will be used for behind the scenes in many cases for that. And I think that's going to be an important part of this. Um, but yeah, there's limitations. You same thing on color. You know, I think certain things we are not going to be able to do, but you know, we'll just, I think the state of the art will keep moving forward pretty quickly as people want to do it. That's going to put demands on everybody as suppliers and technology, be it Microsoft, Avid, or, or probably many others on this call. We'll have to figure out ways to solve these issues. Yeah, so I, I would say uh, a couple of things. Number one, it, it really like like uh, Jeff just, just said, it kind of depends on on the use case and the environment. Um, but also, I would say that these that there are no insurmountable uh, technical hurdles here that would prevent these things from happening. Um, so, for example, if you're editing, you don't necessarily 
have to, you know, bring back the camera raw files to like a local uh, machine to do that. You just, you know, review, you know, you can actually work on proxy files or you just, you know, review a low, lower resolution version of, of, of what you're editing on your local uh, machine there. And, and we see these workflows work today just fine. Uh, but also even, you know, um, workflows that require uh, high bandwidth access, like color grading uh, of HDR content. Uh, I know of use cases where people are actually are able to make that work. Uh, a lot of that is just driven by um, not cloud architecture per, per se, but really what ingress and egress, uh, you know, bandwidth you have. Uh, and these things, um, you know, I've been in this business for a very long time and, you know, even though I don't look it, I guess, but uh, anyway, um, can hear the audience laugh that that really is, uh, is a problem here. But anyway, I've been in this industry for a while and uh, uh, I've seen, you know, pricing for fiber access and, and all kinds of things, you know, really drop to rock bottom. So I don't think any of these things will be um, problems long term. And I think also demand has a way of driving solutions and driving costs down and making things workable that didn't seem workable, uh, you know, a few weeks ago or a few years ago. Uh, I mean, who would have thought that the majority of the world is actually watching video on their mobile device? Who would have thought that, you know, 15 years ago, let's say. And, and so that's why I'm saying, I think these things have a change, have a way of solving themselves if, the, if there's enough, um, if there's enough demand. And I think the, the benefits of working in the cloud uh, of, you know, enabling this global collaboration, uh, having so much better control over uh, the security of the content, uh, version tracking, you know, being able to have, you know, diverse teams from diverse locations all working together on the same assets. Um, you remove so much redundancy that we currently have in our workflows uh, where things get recreated because people just can't reuse it and, and stuff like that. And so there's all, there's all these things I think in front of us, uh, if we can address them, um, there's, there's virtually going to be no limit. Uh, and by the way, that's part of the reason why I actually decided to do this job here with Microsoft, because I think there's so much upside and so much potential here uh, throughout the entire content creation and distribution industry. You mentioned uh, upside. Again, thanks for segueing for me. Uh, <laughs> what do you think can be done to make cloud workflows more enticing? Uh, and not to be used just as a stopgap during, you know, however long this thing lasts. Uh, is it, is it the technology needs to be easier for people to use? Is it price point? I mean, let's just say, call it what it is, what it is. People are concerned about, you know, uh, the CapEx versus OpEx and uh, how much am I going to pay for this per month? Uh, is it just, uh, is it security? I mean, what are the things that have to be done to retain users and to entice users to stay? Uh, yes. <laughs> to what you said. Look, I think in any technology, we always price performance, you know, ease of use, um, you know, being flexible in the way people can deploy and, and, and pay for it. So that's, and that will, like any technology, it will continue to evolve and has moved. I think what I find when I talk to customers and sit in front of uh, people talking about this is they don't realize, a lot of people have misconceptions in their head that they, they gained maybe even years ago. It's moving so fast that people don't realize just how uh, flexible and affordable this is. Yeah, everyone has their specific concerns or issues, but I think, I don't think it is. I mean, I think people are, to your point, people are using some stop caps, Michael, but I don't think they are gonna go back to, I mean, you know, people say the new norm or whatever, but I don't think we're going back to the way it was, I'll say that. I think that one is, it's, this is gonna be a gradual coming back, it's gonna be a phased approach, but I think, when I talk to a lot of executives in meetings, I speak to a lot of them, I spoke to two, two different ones this morning, in fact, in different meetings, is that what they're consistently telling me is, hey, Jeff, Avid, and, and technology suppliers in general, I'm not going, I as an executive, senior executive of this company, I'm not going back there. I mean, we, we've proven we can do it remotely. Why would I continue to fly people onto set, on, into the studio, onto the you know, live sports event? They're all, pre or the news, they're all pretty much saying to me that, they're gonna look at ways to reduce the travel, reduce how many people actually have to be on site, how they can leave people where they are and, and work more remotely. I think we as an industry of technology suppliers, we've done a lot so far, but we have a lot to do because I think people are gonna want a lot of capability out of this very fast. And I think that's really, we just, I think we're gonna have to move fast on all fronts. That's why I said the answer is yes. I think we've got to move quickly, but 
I think people are, are going to be, this is here to stick, I, I would believe. Yeah, to, totally agree with that. We're not going back. I think the world is actually not going back. This doesn't just apply to media and entertainment. This this, this applies to to a lot of things. Uh, you know, all kinds of industries and and the way people work. Uh, we're not going back. I think, and also, um, I would say, security is already not an issue. I don't think pricing will end up being an issue. Uh, again, demand will solve that problem very quick, very quickly. I think the 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 biggest um, challenge for us uh, as a as a as a as a provider of cloud platform uh, solutions is really uh, working with industry partners to really provide an easy to use, uh, widely accessible end to end solution. Um, you know, really, as as our friends at Disney would say, the the really is seen screen you know flow that's 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 really 100 percent there and, and and connected and so uh that's like one of my roles here really is to figure out you know uh how we best onboard you know many many different partners of this ecosystem we want to be as open as as possible where we want to be as inviting as possible for for tool vendors for innovators uh, to, to really, you know, work together with the industry to to enable that uh, that innovation uh, in in the content creation and distribution space. And I think that's that's just the thing. It's like this industry has grown over the last hundred years. Um, and um, even if it was just a lift and shift from what exists today onto the cloud, that's already a, a huge undertaking. But at the same time, I think. Uh, content creators also want to take that opportunity to actually be able to um, innovate and reinvent how content gets created. And that requires a lot of uh, uh, development work. Um, and I think we're going to, we are already relying heavily on, on industry partners to, to, to work with us to really make that a reality. It's a very complex um, industry, a very complex environment. Uh, I think that's more of the challenge, really make it all flow seamlessly uh, and, you know, uh, make it accessible. I mean, there's things like, for example, uh, identity, right? If you want to work on one project and then you go into the next and the next, which a lot of, you know, the freelance artists in Hollywood do, how do you make that seamless for them? Um, how do you make content accessible to the right people at the right time and then remove that access when they don't need to access it anymore and so on and so forth? So there's a bunch of issues like that, but again, none of them are uh, insurmountable. I, I just don't see anything that will stop this. Um, to the contrary, I think this is gonna explode now. <laughs>